So I'm going to quickly jump over to the slides. This is the networking session. The primary goal here is to basically make sure everybody's aware of the activities and we can find locations where we might want to jointly work together. So um, I hope everybody knows that OSG has been doing some work regarding monitoring our networks for quite a while. Um, we have this global Perfsonar network pipeline. We have tools and user support. We also track future networking technologies to see where they're relevant and try to plan for them. That's all good stuff, but um, there's some specific topics that we wanted to focus on and raise awareness about today. Um, there are five. Um, the first is some site-specific monitoring that we are missing. Um, in last while's data challenge, one of the missing areas was actually understanding how much each site was sourcing and syncing as part of the data challenge or just part of their normal activity. Um, so the WLCG monitoring task force has been working to provide a template that we would like certainly all the tier ones and the larger tier twos to eventually fill out. Um, from the perspective of future data challenges and also just for understanding our networks, the most important piece is actually providing a network monitoring link. We'd basically like to understand for a given site how much traffic is going in and out at any time. And you know, part of this longer term would be uh, harvesting that data into a central location so it's accessible. Um, but first of all, we need to define what each site might have and uh, provide that information. The next three items are all related to the Research Networking Technical Working Group. Um, there are three primary areas. One is network visibility. And we've been trying to do um, a lot of work to set up packet marking and flow labeling so that we can understand um, anywhere in the network who owns traffic and what the purpose of the traffic is. A secondary area is network usage optimization. This would be things like packet pacing or traffic shaping so that we all become better users of the shared network. And it makes it smoother for everybody to use a larger fraction of the available bandwidth on our links without causing packet loss and bumping into each other. And the third area is um, a challenge, but an important uh, future capability that we think will be um, needed. So network management via network orchestration, there's the GNAG DIS working group that's working on a lot of this. There's um, the Sense project and the Noted project as examples of doing this. So there's quite a um, diverse set of activities um, in the network management space, software-defined networking, network function, virtualization, et cetera. And the last thing I wanted to bring up is network upgrade planning. So ESNet is certainly um, interested in understanding how our US Atlas and US CMS sites will evolve over time. And, you know, especially in, with a view toward high luminosity LHC in the longer term, we'd like to have some understanding, some coherent planning for how our networks will upgrade. So, um, you know, our sites currently uh, planning to upgrade on what time scales, what are the upgrades looking like, going to, you know, end by 100 gig, 400 gig, others? Um, are there timing and uh, concerns or constraints? Are there funding issues? You know, a general topic here about understanding what our networks will look like over the next few years and, and how ESNet might have to evolve to better support us given our plans. So those are the main areas. Um, we've set up a Google Doc. I shared it in the link. I put in some starting questions. There are also um, maybe even a couple more that are already pre-populated in the Google Doc. And so that's all I wanted to say up front. And now it's really open. Um, if people have input, comments, questions on any of these questions, um, let's start chatting about it. Could you put a link uh, to that doc in the chat uh, window so we can just click on it and get there quickly? Yep, I did already, but I will paste it again. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, so this is the, the document that I hope we can capture. Um, questions, comments, I've listed the topics up front. Um, so, you know, this is, is broadly open. Um, I guess I would be interested in knowing 
if there are plans to go beyond 100 gig for any of our sites, anybody know of any plans at their sites to reach, say, 400 or multiple 100 gig? Yeah, certainly labs are all interested in that, right? Yeah. Just right, so just, just a way uh, we have- Some labs are there already, Way. Yeah, some are there. Uh, Slack will likely go beyond 100 gig, probably to a terabit link at some point in the next three to four years. Uh, to support some of the the new experiments that are happening. Yeah, so we yeah we did did this. We currently actually have two hundred. We can easily go four hundred, but beyond that, there there are quite a bit of work. But you'd go four hundred by having two to four. Yes, gigs, yes. not yeah. one four hundred gig link. Right. So and and go beyond four hundred. It, it involves a lot more work. But but wait, aren't we going four hundred to ESnet, but internally only? multiple hundred gigabits? Internally, well, we are talking about the, the network to ESnet. Internally, uh, there is a lot of internal things to settle. Yeah, but I thought to ESnet we go with a single 400. Yeah. So one thing that I did want to emphasize for, for the sites on the call is that there are these activities. And you know, one thing that we're going to be uh, the monitoring WLCG monitoring task force is going to be pushing on is is getting some rough description of sites networks and um, ideally monitoring links. And I don't know how many sites already have a link that even if it's internal, a place to go where they can see how much traffic is coming into and out of their WLCG site. And I would be curious. Um, to get just some responses. Do people already have such links? And in principle, could they be accessible by WLCG monitoring? Well, I would say that uh, we, in, in, well, in our infrastructure, for example, at Slack, we, we don't currently do a good job, but we are interested in using it technologies and even infrastructures developed by LHC for LHC and for other things. But sometimes, uh, yes, I know that we, we have work to do, but also one of the things that I noticed in particular is, recent, is that recently there are probably too many people jumping onto the LHC one wagon that some of them was kicked out. Was that right? No, I mean, there are some complicated things. Certainly connectors to LHC1 need to have the networks that are connecting be predominantly LHC related systems, right? So there are challenges, certainly for commercial clouds and others, how do they access LHC1? And that's been a longstanding discussion in the LHC1, LHC OPM meetings. Um, I'm, I'm asking really about a more basic monitoring capability, just number of bits going in and out um, what we found through Data Challenge 1 is we really had almost no visibility into what individual sites were doing. And that's an important part of understanding how the overall network infrastructure is actually behaving, where there might be bottlenecks, where we have you know, challenges or issues to find. Sean, kind of but what do you define as a site? Because multi-VO places, a site, you know. Right. So, for example, it would be Brookhaven. Right, and so do you have a link that provides a summary of all the input and output traffic? Yeah, ESnet provides it for us. Yep. So there's a but, an, but and it's that in in and of itself is insufficient. It is the the first ask that we are making. We're trying to um, slowly increase our ability to understand what's happening in our networks. Ideally, it would be divided up by experiment. Right, that would be great that might be a refinement. And it might be that some sites can already provide that because they either physically differentiate their links by experiment, or they have some monitoring system that separately tracks flows by experiment. So, so, you, great. so, so you start with Brookhaven and then Atlas at Brookhaven or S Phoenix at Brookhaven, is that the struggle? Correct, correct. That's what Doug was referring to. There's a challenge here. If you see all the bits going in and out, you have no idea, you know, which fraction is um, part of each experiment that's at that site. Or a light source, or, you know, it's different stuff. Yeah. Right, but, but again, from the monitoring task force point of view, we just want to be able to first see total bits in and out. So we yeah. could at least estimate if you're saturated or not. 
Um, and Derek um, brought up in the chat, you know, an issue about the packet marking, um, about whether sites now to view the packet marking and visualize that. And so there are two sides to the coin. There's getting marking of our traffic in place, either through flow labeling or packet marking. And then there's accounting for those bits or, or providing visualization of those bits. And individual sites could certainly set up their own analysis of the packets. We've made the packet, um, the flow labels, the UDP fireflies in a standard syslog format. And so anybody could be capturing those and, and uh, tracking the information about the flows at their own particular site. In general though, we're looking more at the r &E networks. We want to know what's happening say in a transatlantic link. And so we're gonna have to work closely with the network owners to provide some sort of accounting, some sort of visualization of the actual mark traffic. And that is um, you know, part of the work. Right, so I just wanted to add um, that uh, we also are now routing by option, routing the networking information into the general monitoring stream. So you have two ways of getting at that information. So you can leverage the existing monitoring infrastructure if you want to visualize your networking an stuff. Extra yeah, an extra D. The big thing is if we could get the Dcash people to at least just do that one small part as well, uh, that would cover about 99% of all the data traffic. So, uh, so that is something to consider. Okay, and I see Justice mentioned um, the site-specific monitoring. Um, we weren't planning to push ahead for SNMP scans because those are very challenging for privacy reasons or concerns about the infrastructure. Um, but that we're not ruling it out if we can find a, a safe, acceptable way to provide that information. But really what we would like is simply number of bits in and out, at least as a starting point. And, um, the goal is really to have much better differentiated network monitoring by the time we have data challenge two in sometime in late 2023. So we have a while to do it, but it's gonna take a, a bit of work to get that additional information, not only visible, but then pulled into a central location where we can easily understand then what's going on in the, in the network monitoring. Hey, hey Sean, if, if you want um, packet, uh, or metrics from a site, uh, Purdue can can do that. Should we like start a list somewhere of sites that want to participate? Yeah, in fact, we we were planning to start with the tier ones, of course, because they're big sites, but also the larger tier twos, and a lot of those are in the U.S. So definitely, <laughs> we were going to be reaching out anyway. So it'd be great if 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 you're interested in starting now, we can certainly work with you. Um, we're kind of developing the template and the kind of information we're uh, requesting and as well as you know information about what the requests mean what we're looking for under each of those so yeah it'd be great uh, if Purdue's happy to start out we would be happy to work with you yeah cool great and also Sean I think by saying that you are going to go not only to the site level but also go to the experimental level does that implicate that you are going to provide a service for not only LHC experiment, but also other experiments? Right, so the packet marking and flow labeling is, has been designed to be any research and education activity. So right now we've reserved a set of bits for high energy physics and astronomy basically. Um, and there's uh, a factor of eight larger namespace available for others, other global science research education users of our networks. Um, so that is viewed as a general activity. Um, and we would like to be able to support, you know, bioinformatics if they're going to be global users of the network. Um, you know, anybody who's sending traffic across our RNEs um, should have a place where they could put their bits that they're interested in identifying their flows, their traffic. Um, and Carl had a question about um, when a site might be frozen out of analysis if they don't support IPv6. I think the, 
the challenge for IPv6 is that there are some sites globally that want to go to IPv6 only. If they do that, and there are any resources that are not available on IPv6, of course, they won't be able to see that. And so, you know, this is a much bigger question. Um, I know personally, I would love to transition my site to single stacked again, only on IPv6, because I'm, I'm sick of having to manage two different data planes, IPv4 and IPv6. But that's not really feasible unless sort of every critical service is available on IPv6 for the experiments that I'm involved in. And I don't know how long it's going to take. There is a HEPIX IPv6 working group that's sort of tracking the evolution and helping to plan for a future uh, where some sites that want to should be able to go to IPv6 only. But I, you know, I think it's not in the best interest of the experiments to, to rule out sites and resources um, that may not be able to transition for whatever reason. To IPv6. Um, you know, uh, having said that, I'd love it if everybody could push ahead and get to IPv6, and maybe we would have a, a single stack future uh, coming down the pipe. I guess one thing to add to that, real quick, you say want, but we there are these mandates out there that are requiring it, right? From for federal and sites. such. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Tier ones. Yeah, and but again, they've been. It's been hard to interpret if what it exactly means, but I agree there is a push, and I'm glad that push is there. And I, you know, what so, do you mean it's hard to interpret? The language is pretty clear. Well, I've seen some creative interpretation. I am. That's a different statement. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, it's difficult because mm -hmm. there are real technological barriers in certain systems, um, IoT devices. You know, people just logging in from home, right? A lot of ISPs don't support um, IPv6. So, you know, in this world of uh, teleworking, it would be impossible to be completely IPv6, right? Until the rest of the world catches up. Um, so it does, the message does have to be nuanced and that's driven by technology, not by policy. Yeah, and from, from my perspective, I have a lot of tier three sites who want to contribute to the experiment. They have experimenters who have resources that they want to contribute, but they have IT departments that can't or won't help them transition out of UV6. And so they're stuck in the middle of this pull, right? Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're at the end of this session, but I would encourage everybody, especially who put comments in the chat, to also make Put those comments at relevant locations in the Google Doc. Um, and I will also, um, at the end of this meeting, I'll get the text from the chat and I can at least go back through and take a pass at, at adding them to the doc where they're missing. Um, but we should, we should continue to stay in touch and there will be contact in the future from the monitoring task force and, and others about some of these topics. And certainly we welcome contributions in any areas that any of you are interested in participating in.